Well, welcome to the third section of uh, the teacher work sample. In this section, we're going to look at uh, the teaching of the unit and then also how uh, kids did in the assessment area. So here, uh, we're going to look uh, oh, at eight different or maybe nine different uh, sections that are going to have you reflect upon your lesson. Uh, kind of talk about how you managed it, uh, how the kids interacted, uh, how they communicated with one another, and then what your results were like on the pretest, uh, on your formative assessments, and then your summative assessments. And we'll ask you uh, to an analyze the difference between the pre and post, and in your subgroups, the difference between your two subgroups on the formative and the summative assessments to see what differences there were to give you any insights into uh, how kids did. So let's get started and look at section three, teaching and learning. The first uh, area that you'll be asked is to reflect upon uh, your daily teaching of each lesson. And here, as you teach, I might suggest that you uh, jot down notes um, so that you can go back and remember, or that night, uh, write that daily reflection, what went well, uh, what was successful, uh, and then what things uh, challenged you, uh, and what you could do to maybe change it uh, next time to, m to make it b uh, better. So that's what you'd do on day one, day two, however many days it takes you to teach your lesson, you would kind of reflect upon how things went. Um, Typically, uh, this goes probably multi-pages sometimes um, in the sense that you kind of talk about what you did that day and then what worked, what didn't work, uh, what you planned to change, and maybe give us some insights and maybe why it didn't work or why it did work. Uh, so uh, that's reflective because great teachers are reflective practitioners. They, they uh, always think about especially driving home, what what went well today and what uh, didn't. And any good teacher will tell you as they were driving home, uh, some days are good and some days just aren't so good. Then second, uh, we'll ask you to look at uh, how you manage the lesson. Uh, I always like for you, even though we haven't really talked about in, in looking at the text, yeah, uh, the management system, your rules and routines, procedures. You might list uh, what rules you had, any procedures you used, uh, routines at work, like how you passed out papers and the like, and then how you reinforced uh, your positive and negative um, reinforcement strategy. So a lot of times good teachers will have a hierarchy of, of strategies that they use from simply a pause to eye contact to um, uh, verbal desist where you ask your kid to stop to moving uh, him to another seat to where you take him out in the hallway and talk to him to um, which are all low level types of things um, up to actually uh, send them to their office but what specific uh, positive strategies did you use to prevent uh, kids from uh, being disruptive and um, How do you reinforce that, both in a positive and negative way? Typically, here's what uh, some have written in the past, uh, talking about their procedures, rules, some of the prevention strategies in place, and then they even, in this case, they listed 10 rules. That's quite a lot. Typically, most teachers will have four or five that are positively written. And then uh, this person put in their discipline hierarchy, which is quite good from using silence and pause all the way up to having the kids see them after class. So uh, quite a good list of discipline uh, strategies. But uh, kind of write about uh, how you manage your lesson, how you, you, what your management plan was like. Then then C, uh, how did the kids interact? What multiple strategies did you provide uh, to motivate kids to uh, interact with the material, to interact with others? Uh, how do you gain their interest? Uh, wh what specific strategies did did you use? Uh, maybe for uh, assets or um, introductions. Uh, and then how did you uh, get them to uh, 
uh, want to learn, uh, what cooperative learning activities, what um, Kagan strategies, what uh, even going back to Maslow's uh, uh, nine strategies that might you have used to get kids to to interact with one another, and that's what you write about in C, how they became engaged in your lesson. And in D, uh, you're described uh, the different ideas that you used uh, to promote student-on-student uh, -student communication uh, or teacher-to-student sometimes, but uh, what questioning techniques did you use? And we're spending quite a lot of time on questioning techniques and discussions uh, um, in gaming, in uh, the corporate learning. Uh, a, sometimes you could even have kids rate themselves uh, using rubrics, but uh, what multiple strategies did you use to get kids to interact with, with themselves? And then in uh, E, F, and G uh, sections, uh, they're going to ask you about your pre-assessment uh, and your formative assessments and then your summative assessments. And they're asking you to discuss the results and how you use these results to change the behavior. For example, uh, in the pre-assessment, uh, when you diagnose what they knew, uh, first tell us what the, the analysis of the results were uh, and then show what objectives they kind of knew or didn't know and reference it to uh, the learning objectives and give us an idea of how you use that data to just change or uh, construct uh, the rest of your, your lessons. Uh, was there any plan to differentiate for specific learners that really did poor on the pre-assessment? Uh, almost the same thing for the formative of assessments here. You look at for each of the assessments what how they did um, in relation, especially in relation to the specific objectives. Um, were they learning what they intended to learn? Did you have to accommodate or modify? based on any of these formative assessments, what you were doing with your initial lesson plan. Um, and then did you have to differentiate, uh, uh, change the way or provide special attention to those kids that didn't do well on these uh, formative assessments. And then under the summative assessment, um, as you disaggregate the data between the pre and post test, uh, kind of as you write it up, discuss how it related to specific objectives. Yeah, they, I'm sure there's going to be a significant difference between the pre and post, uh, but was there anything that stood out? Um, and then in the summative assessment, uh, at the end with, did they learn what you wanted to learn? Were there any objectives in that summative t assessment that uh, were below 80 percent or uh, a certain portion of kids didn't learn. Uh, what were you going to do to, if, if it's way low, uh, what were you going to do to uh, make sure that they did learn that? Uh, typically how they look, uh, they're written uh, a little bit like this, uh, uh, but always connect uh, your your discussion to spe the specific objectives that are being met or non met and try to show how that data influenced your, especially in the pretest, your planning and then the formative, how you adapted the strategies that you found in the formative assessments. Um, specifically for the formative assessments, uh, again, it, it, it's, it's talking about. Uh, which one, what objectives were met, uh, uh, what uh, data, low data influenced your planning, or even high data influenced your planning, um, and how you adapted based on what you found from these uh, short quizzes or uh, short things that you did as you taught the unit. But then the summative assessments are a big thing. We want to compare the means uh, between the pre and post test. So what you would do 
you would uh, develop the mean for the pre-test uh, and then develop the means for the post-test and display those for uh, the class and then each of your subgroups. Uh, we're not going to ask that you do any t-tests or unless, unless you really like to. If you've taken methods of research, you probably know what we mean, but you don't have to do any statistical analysis uh, between the two to see if it really statistically significant but based on uh, your post test were any of the objectives met or not met um, so usually 80% is a good gauge if 80% uh, of your kids got 80% of material right that's usually what many w will term as cutting off points so basically to do that you're in your appendix you'll be showing uh, the pre-assessment data uh, and the document uh, and the pretest what you could do is just say pre and post test because they should be the same now in math it might be different because you may not even give them the same problems but you're doing the same concepts but uh, as much as you can keep the pre and the post the same uh, but it lists those uh, show that in your uh, appendix um, and then any formative assessment you use a rubric for a formative performance assessment uh, show that in the appendix uh, and you should probably show, show the, the scoring key with it and uh, same thing scoring key for your summative um, so your appendix will probably be qu quite long And then also in the appendix, you're going to show a visual representation of your desegregated data. And here, and these can be done on Excel spreadsheets uh, um, pretty easily. Uh, but typically, you will show your pre and post test uh, data for your whole class, and then your various subgroups or your focus student if you had one of those. Um, and typically they look all different ways. You can put them in a pie chart. Um, you can put them uh, in, as you see below, in any sorts of graphs. Uh, sometimes if you're in PE, you're doing data counts. Uh, you could even show the, the uh, data count uh, in, in a table. So, and again, using those student names. But you will display uh, the summative data in your appendix not so much your paper you're simply analyze it in your paper so that's uh, the section three uh, when we come back we'll look at section four where you reflect upon what you found in the data analysis see you then